Okay, so um, thank you very much everybody uh, officially for um, joining our third Plastic Free July um, Acts of Connection session. I cannot believe that we are already in the third week of July. Um, so I'm saying hello to everybody from lockdown 2.0 in Melbourne. Um, so if, if you're a fellow Melbourneite that's in lockdown, I hope everybody's doing really well. If you're not in Melbourne, if you're in other parts of Australia and New Zealand and enjoying a bit more freedom than us, I also hope you're well um, and using your freedom very wisely at the moment and learn from our mistakes uh, when it comes to the coronavirus. But I won't, won't spend any time on that. I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for joining our session today. Um, we run these acts of connections every week as part of the Green Impact Program. So obviously you've all found it um, through being part of a Green Impact team, or hopefully you're a part of a Green Impact team. If you're not, um, if you just heard about the program or you've seen some communications about it, uh, I really do encourage you to think about joining a team or creating a team if you're not already a part of one. Uh, we've got uh, 13 universities participating in the Green Impact Program this year across Australia and New Zealand. And it really is uh, an amazing opportunity for you to connect with your colleagues, connect with other students. Um, if you're on campus, then that's amazing. Uh, if you're not, there's still opportunities for you to do a lot of things uh, remotely through the Green Impact Program. And I've just got a photo here with some of the amazing teams that we've had over the last couple of years getting involved to help make their campuses and um, even their homes more sustainable. So uh, if you're not already part of a Green Impact team, please, please, please uh, support your sustainability, um, sustainability teams and get involved because the more that you involve and engage in the programs, then um, the more we can help support you to do these amazing things to make a better planet for people and for everybody. So that's my little Green Impact spiel right at the beginning. Thank you <laughs> for letting me say that. Um, but yes, today we are here to talk about uh, an element of the plastic waste problem that often can be a little bit overlooked. So uh, we're going to be discussing um, fabric and fashion. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, let me see if I can bring the chat up. Like, is this something that often comes to people's, the forefront of people's minds when they think about plastic problem or plastic pollution or, you know, uh, plastic free July? Was anybody surprised to see that this came up in our in our schedule of events. If you just wanna pop um, any comments in the chat, then we can sort of have a look at those if you don't wanna unmute yourself. Um, oh, thanks, for that. I just saw the prompt to hit record. Thanks, Rav. Um, so a few people surprised, some people not, so that's good. Um, oh, we've got somebody from the School of Fashion and Textiles, amazing. Um, and if, you, if, I, if I say anything wrong at any point today, please feel free to jump in and correct me. Uh, I wanted to say right from the get-go that um, I'm not a, an expert specifically in um, the textiles or the fashion or fabric industry. All of the information that I'm presenting to you today is from um, what I've researched and what I've put together specifically for the session. So um, I've certainly learned a lot I know um, as somebody that's been an environmental and sustainability campaigner for many, many, many years, I know that um, the clothes that I wear uh, and the choices that I make in this particular area is where I need to do the most amount of work um, to become you know, better in what I choose and, and how I use my clothes. So I hope you get to come along on a little bit of that journey with me. Um, so I'm just reading through the comments. I'm seeing some people that are like, yes, you're aware of the problem, um, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind. Um, aware, but never know what you could do about it. So hopefully we can certainly give you some tips and guidance on, on at least how you can start to educate yourself and start to change some of your behaviours, or at least make some better choices. Um, Okay, so uh, thank you for everybody that's um, submitted something to the chat there. Um, that's great. I realise for the recorded version that you won't be able to see that, but if anything really pops up, I'll make sure that I'll read it or Rav that brings it to my attention. So back to my presentation. So I've kind of split the presentation into two components. And the first one I wanted to talk about was fabric and fibres in the first instance. Um, so when I started looking into this myself, I ended up in a really big, deep, dark hole of the internet, sort of researching ancient history of textiles and fibres and just, it is a, a, a massive subject area and it is a really important part of human culture, so much more than I've really given a lot of 
um, thought to about how it's defined a lot of our cultures and, and our evolution from ancient humans through to you know, the pre-modern era. And then we've got the modern era and the industrial re revolution and all of the amazing things that happened during that time. So um, I did start to deep dive this a little bit too much and I had to really pull myself back and just think about, you no, know, we'll talk about this in really broad strokes um, today. But if, if you find any of the information I'm presenting to you uh, interesting, then I really recommend you start doing some research on your own. There's a lot of information out there that you can find. Um, and as I said, I found it really interesting. I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more now that my interest has been piqued. Um, but I wanted to start off with a question um, for you all just to think about uh, if anybody knows, how long do you think that humans have actually been making clothes for? Has anybody got any ideas around that or um, I mean, maybe you know, maybe you want to throw something out there as a guess. Pop it in the chat and let's see what everybody thinks. Just give it a moment. Forever. <laughs> okay. Um, hundreds of years, 5,000 years since the Stone Age. Got a few people. Uh, so what's that, 150,000 years, Andrea? Ooh, okay. Uh, so lots of different sort of numbers coming through, ranging from, you know, a few thousands of years, uh, 40,000 years. I think Andrea's gone um, 150,000 years. I'm terrible. I don't know when the Stone Age, I'm not good with placing the eras in, in like how many years away that was. So the Stone Age <laughs> might, might, might be correct. But um let me bring up the answer for you. So humans have been making clothes um, for between 100,000 and uh, 500,000 years. And when I say making clothes, the first clothes that there's evidence of in terms of an archaeological record um, is more so, you know, um, putting animal hides and skins together and using uh, very raw materials, things from, from nature to sort of cover ourselves in terms of um, you know, protection from the elements. Uh, so um, that period happens around the, the end of the last ice age, makes sense. Um, and as I said, the anthrop anthropologists believe that animal skins and vegetation were adopted uh, as coverings uh, from cold, heat, rain, especially as humans really began to migrate to new climates um, across the globe. So, and a fun fact that really struck me when I thought about this is that wearing clothes is an exclusively human characteristic um, and it is a real feature of most human societies. Um, so it, it just sort of blew my mind when I thought about that. I'm like, yes, we are the only animal on this planet that's ever thought to put clothes on. Um, so obviously it can be a bit hard to date these sorts of things because clothes, especially made from natural fibres, haven't really aged too well in the uh, archaeological records. Um, but some of the uh, interesting techniques they've used to date um, fibre, more fibre clothes, actually came from genetic analysis from lice which again, I'm just telling you some of the interesting facts that I've learned. I feel like I'm on an episode of um, quite interesting just to start the conversation today. Um, so there's been genetic analysis that has seen that the um, body lice that we find on humans diverged from head lice around some 170,000 years ago, um, which supports evidence that this is around humans began wearing clothes. That's when we saw deviation from head lice to body lice. So there you go. Um, if you take anything away from that today, maybe maybe that's a quite interesting fact. <laughs> Ew. Yeah, sorry, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> um, so the first textiles, this is when we start looking at not just sort of putting raw components together, but, you know, um, putting materials into um, making threads and, and things like that. So the first textile, textiles dated back as far as 6,500 uh, BC. Um, the first type of textiles that we started seeing were um, felt or spun fibres that were made into yarn and then they were netted, looped, knitted or woven to make fabrics. So these started appearing in the Middle East um, late during the Stone Age. So whoever popped the Stone Age in the, uh, in the chat there, um, you're on the mark in terms of uh, clothes made from textiles. So... As I said, since the very first creation, methods of, of fibre and textile production have continually evolved. So they're really closely linked to the evolution of sort of humanity. It's a really interesting um, topic. 
Uh, and as much as I'd love to spend a, a bit more time on that, I'm not going to, but I just thought it was a nice way to start this conversation and give a little bit of context to um, sort of the diversity and evolution of fabrics. Um, but we're sort of going to jump straight into um, a really pivotal point in time in terms of modern history, and that is um, the industrial or pre-industrial, you know, just before the Industrial Revolution. So as we know, the Industrial Revolution changed quite a lot for us. Um, and it was a time when we sort of moved away from um, doing things on a really small local scale into you know, industrializing, modernizing, using fossil fuels and machinery um, to make production bigger and faster and, and, and much more intense. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, what we saw in terms of um, fabric production and um, textiles particularly in the Western societies, was uh, textiles made on limited scale by you know, individual workers, usually on their own um, premises, using hand-spun fabrics uh, from silk, wool, and linen. So there's some of the examples that I have up on the slide there. Um, but then when we move into the Industrial Revolution, this is when we saw um, fabric production becoming mechanised on a really large scale. Uh, machines being powered by water wheels and steam engines and um, we really saw a shift from that, saw a shift from that small scale production to mass production based on assembly line organisation. Um, but in fact the vast majority of people that worked in these factories were women um, and this is also where we really saw um, those pre-industrial fabrics like silk, wool and linen um, being eclipsed by cotton. So cotton really did become um, sort of the fabric or material of the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's made from, obviously now we grow cotton as a plant, uh, and it's a super strong fiber that really held up well to the hard mechanical treatment that the spinning machinery used in this period. So you know, this is all around the time that cotton was being cultivated en masse across the globe, but you know, particularly in colonies in India, in the Middle East, in the USA, uh, and until 1860, it was largely produced by slave labour. So following the timeline along, we move from um, sort of the Industrial Revolution where we saw this massive change uh, into the early 20th century where, you know, we continue to advance in technologies and the things that we use. And we also have the invention, the invention of plastic, moving to the plastic fantastic era. Um, so uh, when plastics are created using petroleum and chemical chemicals. Um, and once plastics were um, started being made, we realized that we could make really strong synthetic fibers from plastic. So once this, um, once this came into play, we saw really big advancements in fiber spinning um, machinery uh, and control systems that allowed for much greater control over things like the diameter and shape of fibers um, and synthetic fibers could be engineered with you know, so much uh, more precision than natural fibers. Uh, so of course, we started to see a lot more of them on the market. Uh, between 1930 and 1970, we start seeing things like nylon, polyester, spandex, spandex and Kevlar. Um, and clothing producers pretty much took these synthetic fibres on uh, as mainstream and often then started blending them to get really optimised properties. So this fit in well with uh, our changing lifestyles at the time. We went from uh, really changing the way that we, that we wore and, and um, the type of clothes that we used with the lifestyles, activities and demands of the 21st century. Um, so we started really feathering clothing producers that could make things uh, with desired properties that we wanted. You know, we wanted increased strength, elec, elec, elec <laughs> I can't say that word, elasticity. That's the one I wanted. Strength, elasticity, durability, breathability and warmth. So synthetic fibres provided this solution for us. Um, we were able to go from having a few basic natural fibres um, to synthetic fibres that allowed us to have clothes and all sorts of materials, um, products that were resistant to stains, to flames, to wrinkles, to micro microbial life. Um, the advancement in 
dye technologies that went along with this also meant that um, we could previously colour really difficult natural fibres or even natural and synthetic fibre blends. So you know, the world of fashion and fabric really opened up around this time. Uh, and of course, as the extra bonus, um, synthetic fibres were extremely cheap to produce. So that's all amazing, isn't it? Fantastic. We've got synthetic fibres. They're doing all these wonderful things for us. Um, no dramas, right? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, uh, due to the cost and versatility of synthetic fibres, more and more this became the fabric that our clothes were made from. So polyester, nylon, acrylic, uh, all sorts of synthetic fibres and blends are all forms of plastic. And today, uh, about 60% of all the material that makes up clothes worldwide is made from these plastic fibres. So, you know, some people don't even realise this might be a problem, you know, can't tell that your clothes are plastic. Plastic can be recycled, so it's no, no big issue, right? Um, does, anybody, does anybody know what, what have, want to have a guess in the chat what you think the biggest issue with um, plastic clothing actually is? Just curious. So, okay, yep, there's a few things coming through. Quite a few people on the money with microfibers, microplastics, um, particles getting into the waterway. Yeah, so everybody's fairly on the ball with this, which is awesome. Um, so the main problem with, um, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm one behind on my slide. 60% of the material we make in our clothes is plastic. Um, and just by washing our clothes, we're polluting our oceans. And this is a, a really becoming a really big issue, or we're becoming aware of how much of an issue this is um, with sort of more research on, on microfibers and microplastics and looking at what's in the ocean and what's moving through the food chain um, through bioaccumulation and all those sorts of things. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we know that plastics in our oceans is already a big problem. Um, for anybody that joined us on our first um, plastic-free session might have uh, remembered this image. Uh, I shared this one as one that really speaks to me as, um, you know, just the devastating impact that we have of plastic waste in our oceans. So I wanted to pop this one in again, because um, often this is what people think of, or, you know, straws or cups or bags being eaten by turtles and because they look like jellyfish, that's what they think of when they think of plastic waste in our oceans. Um, but the reality is um, the majority of plastic waste actually comes from things like microfibers and really micro um, broken down bits of plastic. Um, so the way that this happens is that uh, every time we wash our clothes, we uh, literally wash hundreds of thousands of fibres into our water supply. Now they're really small, um, we're talking like teeny tiny, it can be less than five millimetres in length with diameters that are measured in micrometres. So a micrometre is one hundredth of a millimetre. Um, so hundreds and thousands of these are coming out of our clothes when we wash them. Uh, and they eventually do reach the ocean. So a good way to think about this in, in a comparative view is to, um, to visualise the lint that you collect from your dryer. So anybody that uses a dryer um, knows that you've got like a lint collection area that you need to regularly clear out. So that lint is actually formed from tiny bits of threads from your clothing coming out that have been dislodged and they're caught in that mesh screen. So this happens in exactly the same way when we're washing, probably even more so. Um, but when we're washing it, they're so small and there's no filter inside most washing machines that they don't catch them. So instead, the, these fibres just uh, pass through our waterways, go through sewage treatment plants. Um, and, you know, sometimes they do get caught in um, sewage treatment plants. Uh, if the, depending on where in the world or what type of treatment that the water is going through. So can anybody have a, hazard a guess on to where the, these microfibers might be going if they are caught at a um, treatment plant? Just keep an eye on the chat, see if anybody's got any ideas. Have a quick sip of my coffee while I do. Waste in the environment? Yep, pretty much. 
Um, one of the things that can come out of waste treatment plants is actually fertilizer or you know um, sewerage slurry that goes out for massive treatment in areas to be um, you know treated with with time and, and heat so that it's safe to use um, on the land as a fertilizer as a growing source. So um, if it's not going into our waterways, it's going into our soils basically. Um, for the ones that do end up in the waterways, then they become part of ocean um, microplastic, which is a pretty huge issue. Um, and it's one I think that is becoming a lot more, um, there's a lot more noise about ocean microplastics or microplastics in the ocean, so which is good. We're starting to um, become more aware and more educated on how our plastics end up in the ocean and what the impacts are that they're having. Um, and obviously that's part of our session today to, to give you as much information around this issue as you can so that you can be informed and make better choices and hopefully share um, your knowledge with, with your colleagues and your families and those around you as well. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got lots of different types of um, synthetic fibres that are used to make clothes. So these are some really um, common ones that we see. We've got acrylic, polyester and like polyester cotton blends. There's lots of blends with sort of cotton as well. Um, so uh, there was a study done in 2016, which is what the, the data that I've used on the screen has come from. So in 2016, the study was conducted to see how many of these fibers could be shed in the wash. So they fitted a front loading, a front loading standard washing machine with a special filter to collect these fibers. And they tested the swatches of these three different fabrics, um, acrylic, uh, a polyester uh, cotton blend t-shirt, a polyester hoodie and an acrylic sweater. Um, and after just a few watch washes, so all garments will um, shed more microfibers when they're brand new. Um, so they shed the most when they're new. So in this study, they did a few washes of new garments and they found that the uh, acrylic fabric shed the most followed by the polyester and finally the poly cotton blend. Um, so they found that in a typical wash with sort of mixed clothes going through it, that uh, 700,000 fibres could come off from a single wash. Um, so it's pretty, pretty mind boggling when you think about those numbers. Uh, we've also got a, another study that I've put some stats up and this is around um, fibre loss from washing fabrics. So there are different studies that come up with um, sort of different estimates around how much um, is lost from different fabrics. So in 2011, there was a, another one that found that around 1900 fibres could be released from a single thing, synthetic garment in the wash. Um, whereas another estimated as many as a million fibres could be released from washing um, polyester fleece. So it's, it's really hard to pin down the exact amount of plastic pollution per washing load that we have because there are so many variables that contribute to um, fibres shedding. You know, we've got things of like what the garment is made of, what the materials are used, and then there's the washing conditions that you're using. What, what's the water temperature? What's the detergent type? Are you using fabric softener? How full is your machine? All those sorts of things. So just put these up to give you some idea around, um, you know, the potential for uh, shedding of microfibers from your clothes when doing um, a wash. Also, another study found that um, top loading washing machines tend to release seven times more microfibers than front loaders. So if there's ever a, uh, a push, if you're thinking about investing in a new washing machine at any time, um, front loaders are definitely a better option in terms of energy water efficiency and also um, how much microfibers they can pull out of your clothes. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about what microfibers are and how they get into our ecosystem. Uh, what's the problem with them? Um, the main thing with microplastics is that they can be toxic to wildlife just on their own, um, but they can also act like sponges. So they can soak up other toxins in the water uh, and they're often ingested by all sorts of marine wildlife uh, and that's where they begin to accumulate in the food chain or bioaccumulate. Um, so a recent study found that 73% um, of fish caught in the mid-ocean depths in the northwest Atlant Atlantic had microplastics in their stomachs. So 73%, that's a massive proportion of fish. Uh, and they've even found that um, the animals or fish that live in the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean, 
are eating microfibers and have microfibers present in their stomachs. Basically, in nowadays, wherever scientists look, um, they find plastic microfibers contaminating the environment. Um, and when they find plastic contamination in an area, often it's these plastic textile fibers that are the dominant source of plastic pollution. So, you know, we see a lot of imagery, as I said earlier, of straws and cups and bags and things um, contaminating uh, the ocean, um, which is certainly a massive issue. I'm not saying it's not, but predominantly it's textile microfiber fabric, uh, textile microfiber. Uh, I'm getting myself all tongue-tied now. Um, they are the, the, the most dominating source of plastic pollution and they can be found in beaches, in mangroves and even in Arctic ice. Uh, and pretty scarily, it's in a lot of the products that we now eat and drink. So again, I'm quoting a lot of studies and things like that. I'll have all of the um, reference materials in our Plastic Free July document uh, that we, we've got for all of this series available if you're interested to learn more or see where we've got um, our information from. So uh, again, we've got another recent study that's from the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology that says it's possible that humans are now consuming anywhere between 39,000 to 52,000 microplastic particles a year. Um, and most of these particles are plastic fibres. Um, it's just absolutely terrifying when, when you think about it. Um, because microfibres are so tiny, um, and many of them do end up in the ocean or on the ocean floor, it's, it's really hard to get um, an accurate census on, on, on them and where they come from. Um, but according to the 2017 International Union for Conservation of Nature report, they estimate that about 35% of the microplastics that enter the ocean do come by synthetic fibres. Um, and it really does underscore how much of a global problem this is, because synthetic textiles are, are definitely more common in developing nations, and it's often where they're produced. Uh, and that's where they don't have the robust water treatment facilities to filter them out that you might see in, in other countries. So regardless of the exact proportion, basically the issue is that microplastic fibres are a really important contributor to plastic pollution. Uh, again, when we think about how long plastic actually lasts for. So we already know that plastics can take hundreds, even thousands of years to degrade. So all the plastic that we've ever made, all the plastic that we throw into the ocean is gonna be here long after we've gone and around for many, many generations to come. What happens when you actually consume uh, microfiber plastics and what's, what, what happens when it get in, gets into your body? Does it get into your bloodstream? Does it sink into your gut or does it just pass through without doing any harm? Um, this is another area that a lot of research is going into at the moment. Um, scientists still aren't quite sure about the amount of microplastics that the body can tolerate or how much damage it actually does. Uh, another study which came out of King's College in London hypothesised that over time we have this accumulative effect of ingesting plastics that could be toxic to us. Um, and again, this depends on the different types of plastics that we have. So um, some plastics have varying toxic properties. We can see that where you know BPA used to be used in all sorts of things and then we phased that out because of the leaching, um, you know, the fact that it leached out of uh, products really easily and it had all sorts of issues with endocrine disruption and um, really bad products. So BPA free has become something that we've seen quite a lot of. Um, but some of the plastics that we consume could be made from toxic chemicals like chlorine, um, while others could, like what we talked about earlier, be sponges. They can pick up trace elements of chemicals like lead, which is also found in the environment and used in a lot of clothes production. So the buildup of these toxins that come with it can, can impact the immune system over time. Um, researchers from John Hopkins have looked at the impact of eating seafood contaminated with microplastics. And they too have found that uh, the accumulated plastic could damage the immune system, uh, disrupt the endocrine system and upset, you know, just your gut's general balance. So at the moment, scientists are kind of scrambling to understand the dose at which microplastics start to have more noticeable health effects. Um, but like air pollution or harmful construction materials, um, those who have more exposure or pre-existing conditions may be less able to tolerate plastics. 
Uh, and it's also important to remember that microplastics come in lots of different forms. So we've got, um, you can get fragments, pallets, beads, fibres, film, uh, and they can be all made up of a different number of uh, different chemical additives, basically. So um, they've sort of described them as uh, being, as having multiple personalities. So um, the multiple personalities of microplastics might harbor, harbor toxic chemicals, while others could be, um, you know, vectors for things like bacteria and parasites. So it's, it's really quite scary um, and something that we need to be, to be thinking about how we reduce these impacts, not just for us, but, you know, for all of the um, animals in our ecosystems and our food chains that are consuming all of this plastic on a daily basis. So what can we do? Um, you know, now that we've sort of had all the doom and gloom about this major issue, it is important to think about what changes that we can make um, to start having a positive impact and to start changing, turning some of these things around. Um, it might be really easy just to think that the, the easiest way to, or the best way to go about this is just to start buying natural fibres um, and, you know, going back to only wool and linen and things like that. Um, but the issue with this is that um, it's a bit of a, a luxury to think about those types of purchases and being able to purchase clothes that are only made from 100% pure and natural uh, materials. What we really need is a solution that's actually workable and accessible for everybody on the planet, not just for those that have um, the resources and, and the financial ability to be able to purchase and make the decisions, so you know, make those ethical and conscious decisions. Um, more often than not, we see that people with money can can do that sort of thing, and then the um, people that don't are left behind and are forced to sort of buy the, the cheap and nasty stuff that has the most and worst impact. Um, so we need to really make sure that we don't just go straight down there. Okay, everybody goes out and buys organic wool and cotton and hemp clothes and, um, and that's how we fix that solution because at the moment it's really not a workable solution. Um, and a lot of the natural fibres that we produce clothes from actually have massive environmental impacts themselves. So um, cotton is a huge environmental um, uh, impacts in terms, particularly in terms of the water consumption that it uses to make. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think there's a bit quite, it's quite a well-known thing that um, cotton uh, takes a huge amount of water and land and there's all sorts of issues uh, associated with it. But I just wanted to point out that sort of the solution to this needs to be more systemic. Um, and it can be really simple with some of the selections that we make. Um, starting with washing machines. Um, so at the moment, we don't really have a lot of washing machines that have these sort of filters that can filter out microplastics involved. So this is something that we need to come from, um, you know, the producers of these types of things to think about how they can better um, create machines that help with this problem. Um, and it's also textile manufacturers to be thinking about how they can design fabrics that shed less and clothing companies that can um, be more mindful and start thinking about closed loop technologies and all that sort of thing. Um, we can still make a difference though in making some choices from our washing machines. So again, as I said earlier, front loading washing machines are much better than um, top loading washing machines. We can also wash our clothes less if feasible. Obviously, I don't want to promote anybody having stinky, gross clothes out there, but you know, washing less, using cooler short cycles can help reduce the amount that your clothes shed while you're washing them. Um, and then there's also these really nifty things called Cora balls. Have anybody heard or does anybody have a Cora ball? Um, there's a picture of on the slide here, and these are a little device that actually go in the wash with your clothes and can help collect up lots of those loose microfibers. And um, basically you can clean it out like you would a lint um, section of your dryer and pop it in the bin. It's all you can do with it at the moment is to put it in the bin. You can't recycle those fibers, unfortunately. Again, that comes back to you know, the development of technology that we need to see from producers and manufacturers to thinking about closed loop fibers and how they collect materials, bring them back and reuse them. Obviously, recycling plastic is a very degrading process. The quality of plastic degrades each time you recycle it, and really, it can only be good quality plastics can only be recycled a couple of times. Um, 
our waste hierarchy needs to always be our mantra when thinking about how we improve in these areas. Refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, rot is we need to be doing more and more of this. So if you think about it, just buying less, buying better quality where you can afford it. Um, Andrea just popped on before and said that you can, if you can wear your clothes just an extra six months, you can really reduce the carbon footprint um, of them. So um, I've talked way too long about fibres, so I'm just going to super quickly talk about fast fashion before I pass over to Andrea, because this is the other component of it that I wanted to touch on today. Um, so obviously we know now that like the, the material that we use itself is a problem. It's problematic in terms of microfibers and how that gets into the environment. But now we have fast fashion to deal with, which is something that's really coming to the fore basically since the, the early 2000s. Um, you know, the noughties is when fast fashion really became a thing. I think Zara has been, you know, pinned a lot as having um, a lot to do with um, creating the fast fashion movement, so to say. So um, prior to this, you know, uh, particularly around the 60s and things like that, we fashion used to be built on four seasons per year. So your winter, summer, autumn and spring collections um, and designers and um, manufacturers would work to getting new lines out for each of those four seasons. Um, now what we have is around um, 52 micro seasons. So basically that's a new fashion line or a new delivery of stock that gets delivered into our just regular fashion or, you know, uh, clothes stores every single week. Um, and this has been driven, you know, a market driven change that we've seen. Um, sorry, just going to catch up to my notes because I've gone way past them. There we go. Yeah, so Zara apparently started this craze. I haven't fact-checked that one, so if somebody <laughs> wants to <laughs> let me know. Um, but they started this craze by shifting to bi-weekly deliveries of new merchandise back in the early nornies. Um, so the problem with this whole fast fashion movement is that all impacts of it um, are bad. Uh, we've got trend replication, rapid production, low quality, competitive pricing. All of these adds up to a massive environmental impact um, and also on the people that produce the clothes. So um, we've got a massive range of human rights violations that are very closely linked to um, fast fashion or just fashion um, or the garment industry in general. It's a whole um, session on itself. We will be talking a little bit more around modern slavery and fair trade and, and fashion as we move into next month. Uh, Fair Trade Fortnight. We'll be doing that in Acts of Connection if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that as well. Um, but super quickly, I just wanted to touch on some of the biggest impacts from fast fashion. So um, we've got environmental damage, obviously. The fashion industry continues to create massive quantities of clothing, often using toxic chemicals, really dangerous dyes and synthetic fabrics that get into the water supplies. Uh, often, I said, in you know, countries that don't have really good infrastructure um, to deal with this uh, and, you know, poisons the land. We also have um, waste as a massive issue. Um, seeing good old war of waste uh, popping up on the screen. Haven't seen that in a while, but um, this this contributes to a massive throwaway culture. And I apologize, I didn't get a local stat. I've got 11 million tons of garments being thrown away every year in the US alone. Um, so these clothes are full of lead, pesticides, all sorts of other chemicals, most that never break down and just spend the rest of their life releasing those toxic, uh, toxic chemicals into the air, into landfill, into the ocean, wherever they end up. So the fast fashion, um, carbon footprint is massive uh, and actually accounts for 10% of the world's global carbon emissions, which is a pretty staggering figure. Um, so we definitely need to think about how we have more sustainable power production and how that can contribute to a more sustainable um, economy. Circular economy is a big part of this. Again, that's a whole other conversation that, you know, if you're not familiar with circular, circular economy or what that means, I'd really love to do a session on that and talk about, um, you know, this closed loop process that we need to be moving into rather than the linear, you know, create from natural resources, use, throw away for it to rot in landfill and never be used again. And again, um, we have the, off the issue with where our clothes are produced. Um, and who is producing them, often that uh, means that we've got um, 
people being paid very little money in very poor working conditions, creating the, the clothes that we use and throw away so very quickly. So there's a, just a, a very um, quick overview of fast fashion and why it's an, an absolute issue. Again, what can we do? Um, think about buying less. Do we really need to buy, you know, that new top or that new dress or can we rewear things that we already have and, and make better quality decisions so that we don't need to be constantly updating our wardrobe and move away from this sort of fast fashion 52 trends in a year type mentality. Um, remember the waste hierarchy. Again, it's a really good one to just have, have as your mantra. Um, and you can really put this to use by getting into thrifting and op shopping and getting all sorts of amazing secondhand, really good quality garments if you're willing to put in a bit of time and, and effort or if you're allowed to leave to go shopping, that's also a thing as well. Um, and support the slow fashion movement. So now what we're starting to see is, um, you know, slow fashion coming in as a term where we can really support um, and there are people out there that are producing and making ethically um, ethical, ethical clothes um, that support the people that make the garments and, and the companies that make the effort to look after the environment and people that make their clothes. So slow fashion, that's where we need to be heading and moving very far away very quickly from fast fashion. So now, now that I've given you all of that information, I'm going to hand over to Andrea, who's actually going to show us how to um, do a handy upcycle trick. Um, so Andrea, I'm just going to bring our screens back if I can. Uh, no, bear with me one second. Uh, and then once Andrea has done her um, demo, we'll um, have any questions that anybody wants to, um, to ask about this. So Andrea, can I pass over to you? And I'm just trying to change it there so that I come up on my screen. It's working for everyone else. Can you all see me? I can, yes. Yeah, awesome. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, if you're interested in fast fashion as well, have a look at um, hashtag pay up. I would just leave you all to Google search that issue at the moment um, related to COVID. I'm just going to put my mouse to one side. Um, Yep, so for today's DIY, if you're going to try this at home, all you need is a t-shirt. Here's one I prepared earlier, beautiful black t-shirt, um, and a pair of scissors. You don't need fancy, really expensive sewing scissors like mine, just any sharp scissors. And then a ruler, and if you don't have a ruler, just um, a book, any old large book will do. Like my one that's a bit faded because it's been sitting on the bookshelf too long. And I'm just going to swivel my camera down so you can see what I'm doing because I can't quite get the right angle so you can see me and the t-shirt. So we'll just have to have a fiddle around here with my, my fancy new laptop. So can you kind of see my t-shirt there? Yes. Yes, that's working, isn't it? Um, so what we're going to do is like the top of the t-shirt where the neck is is the top of the bag and the bottom of the t-shirt where your legs come out is going to be the bottom of the bag. So you can visualise where that's going. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn the t-shirt inside out. So I've got all the seams facing me outside. So I've done that bit already. You can just see it's a little bit hard on a black t-shirt. And I'm just going to cut the sleeves off. You can do this with a singlet as well, which would make it even easier because then you wouldn't need to cut the sleeves off. And I'm just doing this right next to where the seam is. So I'm actually leaving the overlocked bit of the seam on there just to make it a little bit stronger while I'm using the bag. So let's do that and save all these little bits. Um, there's some really good tutorials on Pinterest online for turning those into like little cat toys or dog toys if you've got a dog or you can make hair ties out of them or all sorts. So they're handy little scraps of fabric to have around. Scrunchies are so in right now. No, scrunchies are everywhere right now. So. <laughs> It might be our next tutorial is making Jojo bows out of old shirts. Oh, no. <laughs> so my niece is six and it's all about Jojo bows right now. Now this t-shirt's got quite a tight neck on it. It's one of these really tight round neck t-shirts. So I'm actually going to cut this up a bit as well so the hole in the top of my bag's a bit bigger. So what I'm going to do is fold it in half so that when I cut the hole it's going to be nice and even. Um, you can see that there. So now I've 
going to cut through these four layers all in one go so that I get a nice even hole in the top of the bag. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to leave about this much width here and that's going to be the thickness of my handles. So it's sort of width of about maybe three or four fingers depending on how fat your fingers are. And then I'm just going to cut that around kind of like a big oval. If you don't trust your ability to cut this freehand, you could get like a dinner plate and sit it down and cut around the shape of your dinner plate. So don't worry, you don't need any technical sewing equipment for this one. So when I open it out, I end up with what looks like just a great big scoop neck singlet. So if you're already starting with a scoop neck singlet, you're kind of already ahead of the game. So what we're going to do now is just work out kind of how deep we want the bag to be because obviously this is quite a long t-shirt so that if you're carrying the bag it would be dragging on the floor. So I'm just going to work out that out by setting the book roughly where I want the bottom of the bag to be and then that'll help me cut some little strips along the bottom. So you can do this with the book or with the ruler. I think I'll do it with the ruler so you guys can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to have my bag ending about here. And then I need to allow a little bit of a seam. So that's sort of about three or four fingers in length as well. So I just want to go down about that length there. I'm going to put my ruler down there. And that's about how much I need to cut off the bottom of my t-shirt for this step. I'm just going to cut along there. And again, I'm doing this really rough and freehand. But if you're a little bit nervous about this, you could get a bit of dressmaker's chalk. And you could make a nice neat line across here. Or you could set a nice long ruler or a book or something along so that you know you've got a nice straight line to cut across or you could not worry because it's a grocery bag and no one will ever see it and then I'm just going to pop my ruler up here or you can set your book along here if you don't have a ruler and then I've just got this gap of t-shirt here this seam so what I'm going to do now is cut strips along the bottom here and I'm just going to cut up to the ruler so it's going to make sure all my strips are the same length that the ruler will stop me cutting too far I'm just going to cut my little label off my t-shirt because I don't need it anymore. So we'll never know if it was a 100% cotton t-shirt or not. I'm cutting these the width of like about a finger width, so about a centimetre. So again, if you're like not very confident with the like width that you're cutting, you could um, yeah, sort of use your finger for measurement. Don't cut it off. Especially if you're in lockdown and you can't get to the doctor. It might be a problem. So what you want to do is cut through both layers of the t-shirt at the same time, like the top and the bottom of the t-shirt, um, and keep them as close together as possible. So it's really good to do this on a table, um, so that the little you end up with little pairs of strips of t-shirt. Move my ruler along so I'm still roughly neat. Andrew, you said you didn't need fabric scissors, but I get the feeling that they're going to be really helpful for this. <laughs> I think if you've got sharp scissors, you'd be fine. Yeah, so like, I think if I got my kitchen scissors out, they would be fine for this project. So, um, because you're pretty much, you're only cutting through a thin t-shirt. So on those sides where you've cut the edge, you've got like the little seam here. So you just need to cut down the seam to make two little loose angles here as well so you just want to cut those on each edge as well. Cut your seam apart. There we are. So now you've got what looks like a singlet with a whole lot of dangly fringy bits on the bottom. They're all in little pairs which looks like it makes no sense at all so far. Um, and then what we're going to do is start with the first pair of these little fringy bits and we're just going to tie them together. This is the most technical part of the process in a knot. And then you're just going to work your way along and tie all of them in a knot. And this is just going to make out the bottom of your bag. So this is probably the point where you should hand it over to one of the kids. <laughs> it's a good school holidays craft project. Lockdown crafts projects. Um, and this is why it's really good to do this on a hard surface like a table because then all the pairs stay stuck together and you don't end up in a great big tangle of little bits of tassel. So 
But what I'm going to do is slide over to the one I prepared earlier and magically change my t-shirt to a blue one. Yes. I love the one <laughs> I prepared earlier. <laughs> so here's the blue one I prepared earlier. Um, so this one's actually a singlet, which is quite handy because now I have a, like, a nice fancy hem on the edge of my handles. So this works quite well with singlets as well. So what I've done is gone along and knotted all the bottoms along here. So once you've gone along and knotted all of them once, what you'll notice, and that might be a little bit hard to show you here, but I'll do my best, is you'll end up with a like one little knotted bit here and one little knotted bit here. And then in the middle, you have like a little wee gap. So you have a tiny little hole. So what you want to do is do a second layer of knots of one from this pair and one from this pair so that we can close up the gap. Um, so you just want to go back along the t-shirt and just do a second layer of knots. And I wouldn't worry too much about this. So like I just kind of randomly start grabbing at things and knotting them along. And then just what you can do is just check at the end. And if there's a hole, just flip it inside out again and and not a few more bits and pieces until it lines up. So it doesn't have to be too elaborate, especially if you're just going to take it to the supermarket and throw a broccoli in it. So, and then this one I've double knotted most of the way. So when you finish, you end up with this great big fluffy dangly mess. We're just going to flip that inside out. And this is your chance to quickly check along the bottom and make sure you haven't dramatically left any holes. But one's looking all right and then you just end up with your little bag all ready to go amazing i love it yeah and i can just pop myself back up there so that'll work with anything that's like a cotton jersey a cotton polyester jersey any stretch fabric that won't fray when you cut it that'll work with that so Thank you so much for sharing. I know I don't own a sewing machine. I don't know how to sew to save my life. It's one of the things that I really want to like reconnect because my grandma used to make all of my clothes for me. Um, so when Andrea said that she had a no sew way to do a, t uh, a upcycled t-shirt bag, I thought, yes, show us how to do it. And I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I think that'll be really handy. And that's a super cool one. Um, for people to use in their green impact um, actions. So some people have actions in their toolkit around making boomerang bags or just getting reusable bags happening. This is a really easy way where you can have a bit of fun and make them as well. So thank you for sharing. Has anybody got any questions for Andrea or um, about the presentation today around um, plastic fibers and fast fashion? I saw Haley posting a link to the Cora balls that I mentioned. Um, so yeah, they're not super um, cheap, unfortunately, but um, really valuable to, to really start pulling some of those microfibers out of your washing um, without too much effort on your behalf at the very least. Just checking the questions. Yeah, the other one that helps is um, a guppy friend. A guppy so friend? Just Google guppy, um, guppy friend and it's like a special bag that you can put your polyester and plastic washing in and it will track all the microfibers in the bag. So it's like a giant, if you imagine a giant lingerie bag that traps microfibers and then you just, they collect in the corner of the bag and you pull them out and put them in the bin. Awesome. Cool. I haven't heard of that one. Thank you. Has anybody else got any recommendations or, or ideas or things that you've come across? Um, anything that you send through will be popping into our plastic free guide that we've been collecting and collating over the last few weeks, which I keep talking about and we haven't put it out yet, but it's all ready to go. <laughs> Um, I don't think anything else is coming through on the chat with questions. So um, I'll start wrapping up for the session today. Uh, we're almost on the hour again. Time flies when you're having fun. So thanks everybody again for joining us. Uh, I hope you learned something today. Um, if you didn't, I hope you're inspired to sort of keep going with your plastic free, um, trying to reduce your plastic footprint and, and work towards more plastic free living. And good luck. We've got a couple more weeks left of plastic free July. So next week, we're not technically doing an acts of connection. Um, rather, acts more broadly is doing a webinar, um, which we're just releasing the registrations for today. Um, so we're going to be talking about rebooting reuse. Um, and this is particularly relevant in sort of a post COVID new world um, that we're starting to deal with. So we've got some great speakers talking about um, behavior change and how we can help to sort of reboot reuse and how it's safe to do so. 
um, you know, without transmitting COVID and, and other um, nasties around. So if you're interested in that, please do look out. It will be a register, a separate registration from the usual acts of connection that we do. Um, and then the week after we're wrapping up Plastic Free July with a collective plock. So this is our opportunity to um, go out there and actually give back to our local communities and our local area, go for a lovely walk all at the same time, whether you're in Australia or New Zealand, um, and pick up some rubbish in the local area. So um, hopefully you'll join us in doing that. I'd really love everybody to take photos if you do go out on the plock so we can start to see um, the amazing work that we're all collectively doing. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very much again for joining. I look forward to seeing you over the next few weeks um, and good luck with Plastic Free July. Thanks everyone. Thank you.